team with Southeast Chapel and other grants now. We are delighted with the response this evening this evening, and we are very happy that we can host so many of you today. We at CAMSAF have been trying to provide a platform that facilitates the exchange of ideas and policy based dialogue between the issues of governance, state, and politics in South Asia and beyond. Since our inception, we have invited policymakers, politicians, grassroots activists, academicians, and former intellectuals to speak on diverse many officials. It is the profit, uh, aim of our society to look beyond South Asia and not think of South Asia in isolation, as the nature of South Asian politics becomes intersectional with the global. Hence, the Marx Bicentenary Lecture. But more importantly, it is because Marxism does not prove to be invited in the global south that we gathered here today for this evening. In most countries in the global south, it is as if Marx visited them and never left. It is as relevant as ever. Therefore, on Karl Marx's bicentenary, we look back at his legacy and the relevance of his works. It's better to speak on this than Professor Terry Hilton, one of the foremost public intellectuals in the world. I don't think he needs an introduction to the TV gathered here, but I'll be brief. Professor Eagleton is a distinguished professor of English literature at Lancaster University and a renowned literary and cultural theorist. Some of his works include literary theory, the illusions of postmodernism, after theory, the idea of culture, reason, faith, and revolution, reflections on the law TV, and the book which is now being reprinted by Marx was right. In case any of you are holding that book, you can get signatures from the program. I now hand over the floor to Professor Eagleton. He's joining me in the Ken. Born and die, and if you had 
identifies the system, then there are alternatives to it, and so on. So I think they were actually trying to find out about what they were newly recognizing, uh, and that being really most lies as a system, as a specific historical system. And that, of course, is part of what Marx did, isn't it? Just as his uh, compatriot Freud uh, discovered a whole concealed continent called the unconscious, yes, which stealthily determined our waking actions and beliefs and utterances. So Marx, in a similar way, um, uncovered the concealed mechanisms by which a very specific way of life, capitalism, actually operated. Um, and that was fairly new. Um, the point of this uh, remarkable book is um, <laughs> to, uh, really to sort of demystify or demystify Marx. A lot of enormous amount of myths, of course, clustered around the figure of Marx. Um, some of them willful misunderstandings, I think, and others not. Um, and the point of the book is just to take these myths one by one and try to show up there as a wonderful basis. For example, the idea that Marx was obsessed by economics, homo economicus, and to that extent was a mere, mere image or inversion of capitalism. It's so, on the contrary, Marx was born by these economics. When he sat there every day, you know, um, in the British Museum, playing by the Uncles on his backside, very painful work, you know. and he was found it very tedious. In fact, he wanted to write to the two books here. He wanted to write one capital, one of them was in ethics, and um, that sometimes is misheard as the county. Um, and the other, the book on that was that. Marx, of course, was formerly staggeringly well read in literature. Great sort of called Karl Marx of world literature, very interesting. In, in the great Central European humanistic tradition, he was far up of been doing that. But he thought that it was irresponsible for him not to attend to what he took to be the generative mechanisms of the destitution and desperation that, as a poor man himself, living in Victorian London, he saw all around him. He shared personally in that. In that poverty. He could have been a professor, eminent professor, I suppose, in any, any European university. Instead, he chose to live in those rather the conditions of a down at heel Jewish emigrant, hounded from pillar to post in many of European society, washed up in Victorian England, um, and remarking at one point that nobody had ever worked so much on money and had so little. <laughs> The only reason he had any money at all was, of course, you know, as they said, you know, some of his best friends were capitalists, not least a man called Frederick Engels, who inherited the mill, the cotton mill, in the city I come from, Salford, near Manchester, and uh, who, without his handouts, uh, Engels also rode with the Cheshire Hunt, by the way. Engels was a bit of a dandy, you know, a, bit of a, a bit of a lack. Um, anyway, he would hand out. Money to Marx. Without that, I mean, they probably the family would have been we kept it yeah. So Marx lived off capitalism. Um, now, uh, far from being obsessed with the economy, the, the whole point of Marx's enterprise was, of course, to free men and women from the tyranny of the economy, or at least to diminish not freedom altogether. Of course, as a good materialist, you wouldn't believe that. But to diminish the despotic power over them of the material the forces that were not within their control, to bring back within human control and harness to moral ends the whole sector of economic life. And in that, Marx was really a good pupil of his, uh, his great mentor, Aristotle. Marx is a closet Aristotelian. He doesn't really come out of it, which is an Aristotelian, but he is. Um, and that's one way in which he wants to, to sub subordinate the um, business of buying and selling material life um, without to be no life to ethical, ethical ends. Marxism, and to do that, of course, one thing, you had to radically shorten the working day. 
you had to harness the technology that was being used to pump more profit out of working people to the ends of emancipating them. To do what? He was concerned about what happened then. Their realm of necessity ended in the kingdom of freedom we get. Marx has interesting things to say more about this in a moment to say about what the kingdom of freedom would look like, what men and women would look like if they were in some emancipated condition. So Marxism, another old myth, gets the dust. Marxism is about leisure, not about labor. There are only two good reasons to be Marxist. One is just to annoy people you don't like. Parents <laughs> or something. And the other one is because you don't like really work. You don't like really work, then sign on, sign on. Um, so it's all about uh, the kingdom of freedom, the kingdom of pleasure. And that, incidentally, is a theme <coughs> taken up by that great Irish socialist, Oscar Wilde. His essay, um, The Soul of Man on the Socialism, is which is widely popular in the British Labour Movement at the time, is very, very close to Marx and Morris. Uh, Morris is, um, why would it actually closer to Marx than William Morris is? I mean, Morris basically is one of the greatest of all British socialists, but Morris really argues the point about work is to make it creative, you know, craft, art. So Marx and Wilde are akin. In believing that we should get rid of it as much as possible. And Wilde takes that to a typically hyperbolic extreme. And you know, for Wilde in the ideal society, we would just lie around all the day in you know, loose, crimson apartments, <laughs> sipping at Absinthe. As one of his uh, poetic friends said, Absinthe makes the tart grow fonder. <laughs> and, uh, sipping at Absinthe, reading you know, Homer to each other. And that would just be working. So, that's an important thing to remember about Karl Marx. It's not very often remembered, nor is um, the fact of his lavish, sometimes the leftist, embarrassing praise of capitalism and praise of the bourgeoisie in the middle class. If you read the Communist Manifesto, the most single, most influential doctrine. Of 19th century Europe, including on the origin of species. If you read the Thomas Manifesto, it is, of course, a hint of praise, something, I to this most revolutionary of classes of Marx Seaston, the most revolutionary class in history, middle classes, who in a very few centuries had transformed the face of the earth, had uh, dismantled the ancien regimes. Well, one or two remnants were in the long term. Charles. Who had who instigated, who had accumulated the most fabulous resources of material wealth in human history, uh, but also, of course, spiritual wealth too. Democracy, the beginnings of feminism, of civil society, the enormous cultural inheritance of the middle class, all of which Marx revered uh, and, and thought, more importantly, had to be the basis of any socialism. You had to go socialist, you had to inherit those precious resources which the bourgeoisie, in pursuit of its own most sordid motive for the individual gain, had nonetheless unwittingly accumulated and could, as it were, bequeath to a socialist future. So that you, you know, you need. Uh, civic institutions, deserved democracy, a skilled and educated workforce, and so on. And if you don't have that, if you don't have that, then of course you are very likely to go stylist. Yes, it's not liberalism which provides the <coughs> sharpest and most negative critique of Stalinism. It is Marxism. So central current of Marxism, which saw as Marx. But if you try to use Marxism or any kind of socialist theory to leap from a position of desperate backwardness into modernity, then it's very likely that you will have to rely upon this increasingly centralized and draconian state. And that in the very act of building up socialism economically, you will dispel it politically and culturally in terms of democracy 
and so on. Uh, it's not that Marx exactly predicts Stalinism, but he does say that in that kind of condition, what you would have is a generalized scarcity. Generalized scarcity, which is a good enough definition of that. Um, so um, that's often not interesting. And just as um, his ferocious opposition to utopia is not often emphasized. The fact that you know people talk glibly about you know, this perfect society that socialists would not at all. How could the materialist, how could somebody convinced of the rough ground of human affairs, of the rough and ragged and unfinished nature of human affairs, how on earth could he imagine that this could be perfect? Well, not as the least concerned with perfection. There's no mention, as far as I know, of that concept in his work. He began his career in contention with utopian socialists. I mean, he'd done something, sure, as well, but he couldn't buy the kind of wouldn't it be nice if if we were all peaceful and kind to each other and so on. Marx was interested in laying the material conditions, unlocking the contradictions that prevented justice and equality and humanity and comradeship and so on. Yes. Um, but he didn't waste his time drawing up elaborate blueprints of what a common society would look like, partly because, of course, any attempt to predict the future is bound to be, in some sense, enthralled to the present. We're about to extrapolate what we know, the land of the present, in an attempt to lead out of it. So there's a certain logical difficulty in Marx. Marx didn't do that. For Marx, there was only one image of the future, and that was the theory of the present. That was the deadlocks which prevented history from beginning. Don't forget, Marx doesn't think we need to start of history yet. Everything that's happened so far in history is prehistory, is one other dreary bringing of change on the cycles of exploitation. Yes. The only true historian would be to break with that altogether. All these professions would be to say what kind of material condition <coughs> do so, what kind of political movement to some extent would you need, but he's not there to make an idol of the future. In fact, Marx, as a secular Jew, is there in a way indirectly inheriting the uh, Jewish prohibition on idols. You can make it to not make an idol of Yahweh, shall, you must make an image of Yahweh. Why? Because the only image of Yahweh is flesh and blood, it's human beings, it's men and women. Yes, that's why you can't bring the images of God. And since Yahweh, for the Hebrew scriptures, is always the God of the future, who's calling you out of the present, keeps you on the move, yes, in a nomadic way, then you can't make an image of him of the future either. I have to be forbidden to make images of the future. Because they, of course, then simply succeed in confiscating kinds of energies that you might otherwise be putting in to try and bring in something back. But whatever it is, it won't be perfect. So those people who ask you, you know, are there still going to be car accidents in this perfect society of yours? I just warn you. Um, there is a theory also. I think again, it's sort of a myth that um, Marx makes a kind of fetish of the working class. Well, for one thing, there's a distinct, an important distinction between Marx, which most people fail to make, between the working class and the proletariat. They're, they're, they're not synonymous. The proletariat is, as it were, blue collar industrial productive workers. That's what Marx means. And they, I think, in you, you recognize, they are a minority of the working class. Or for various reasons, they have a very key role to play in the transformation of capitalism, partly because they were ironically organized in the collective group by capitalism itself, and therefore had a certain communal power. But he knew very well that the majority, the vast majority of working class in Victorian England were domestic servants. And of those, of course, the vast majority were women. So when Marx is speaking of the working class opposed to the proletariat, he's talking about the group that he knows is female, 
that he knows is not productive in the industrial sense of the word, yes, but nevertheless is absolutely vital uh, to the running of that whole society. He didn't mess think that revolution was necessarily violent. Um, people sometimes confuse uh, revolution and reform, don't they? Sort of well, reform is moderate, uh, non violent, piecemeal, evolving change. Revolution is high on the right of the back pains and stuff. First of all, the kinds of changes that Marx envisaged will probably take as long as the changes instituted by the bourgeoisie, by bourgeois revolution, in yes. centuries. I mean, if you were to produce somebody who was sick of the very idea of problems, the very sight of problems, then that would take very long to do. Um, revolutions are very long processes, a long revolution, mental or electronic, Williams calls it. But secondly, um, Marx thought it was possible to have non revolutions, in particular societies, he thought perhaps in England, in Holland, in Germany, um, and certainly. Of course, reform can be extremely tough. You can lose more, you can have more bloodshed in processes of reform, things and civil rights movement in the States, than you may have in a so called velvet revolution, in which a takeover happens without you know, any great, any great loss of blood. Well, what, what the guarantee of all this, sorry, can not violence, of course, is the um, size of position which government makes. You, know, you can't fight all people all the time. You can imprison some of them some of the time or some of them all the time, but you can't you know, arrest a whole populace. And um, that for Marx is what distinguishes the one of the ways it distinguishes between a revolution and a coup d'etat. A coup d'etat or a torture where you call it is a small group of people overthrowing uh, Unpopular government for Marx, a revolution is essentially social, not political. You can't have them, it has to take political forms, of course. Um, as for the state, which uh, Marx is often identified with, you know, status, socialism, state center, Marx was as antagonistic to the state as the Tea Party is, if the law is correct for reasons. That's another story, too long a story, but certainly Marx was not. Yeah. Marx might recognize this as the state, as a power. Marx was not as opposed to power as any sensible person is. It's one of the many errors of postmodernity to shove it rather than the civilized way of the word power. All those to use the word power or authority pejoratively. Yeah. And what a crazy idea. Yeah. It's all very well for those who don't have power. Just scorning it, you know, scoffing it. People need power. I mean, uh, I, I can't get enough of it. Of course. <laughs> 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 you know, it all depends on who is having it, for what purposes, in what context. Yes. There's no escaping power, and that's a good thing to do. Uh, but you have to use it in a certain kind of way. So, yes, Mark saw that <coughs> there would still be there was still power, but it would be a very good I, just as Lenin in the state of revolution uh, sees the state in terms of self-governing cooperatives is quite different from what we see as the state. Um, Marx was, of course, an atheist, though he wasn't particularly a militant atheist like that man who, um, I also forget his name, that man whose wife used to act too much. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, first of all, yeah, nothing wrong with the 
but it's this it's, it's material world for it's with Christianity it's about the immortality of the soul, it's about the resurrection of the body, it's about the transformation of the flesh. Um great. Now, uh, sorry. Um, I think there's a sense in which Marxism is a tragic um, whatever you want to call it, philosophy, of belief, way of seeing as indeed as Christianity. I don't mean by that that they both end in that. They don't. They don't, they don't predict. That's what one would expect. They don't end it. But, but tragedy doesn't necessarily end in that. Um, one of the greatest and first tragedies we have, the old style, uh, doesn't end in that. On the contrary, uh, the dear doesn't really end that. Um, you know, quite a lot of tragedies. Even in Shakespeare, there's almost always a kind of tentative movement in life, uh, which is not just escapism or a cop out, it is part of the tragic experience that out of this devastation something is finally able to move, to begin to move on. Um, tragedy means having to be hauled through hell in order to get to somewhere, some, to emerge somewhere on the side. And there's no guarantees that you will. Clear, for example. The fact that there are no guarantees is known as faith. Yes. If um, crucifixion is a tragic scenario of this life, right? if Jesus had said to himself, well, you know, only six hours up here and then three days or two, and then up to heaven, well, I mean, sounds pretty good, I'll sign on for that. Then, within the frame of Christian belief, Never You have to live your death to the end, as it were, to see it as a cul de sac if it is to be transformed into something rich and rare uh, beyond itself. I once made the terrible mistake of saying the BBC radio tour, pointing out that um, if Jesus did only spend six hours on the cross, as the evangelists tell us, then he was very lucky. Not very lucky to crucify the one who spent so much time. Most people who crucify just thrash him out of the day. Um, probably it was the scourging he had. If you lose a lot of blood before him, then you'll die much quicker. So only have threats to crucify him. Ask them to leave him. <laughs> the, um, it's also called, I now wanted to do an entire convention. Um, it's also the case that. Crucifixion, of course, was affirmed by, by the Romans for political rebels. Jesus died for death at a political level. As I've been said, it was a political level. Maybe it was handy for somebody to, to pretend it was or believe that it was. But most certainly, the point of crucifixion is not just the agonizing thing, but to pin somebody up at the end of the city saying to the other potential dissidents, this is what you will get if uh, you stay out of life. And all of this nonsense. Orders of crucifixion with this reluctance to present it as a kind of metaphysically minded, requiring a sort of guardian, reading, liberal. We know about them, we know quite a lot about them, actually, from second source. He was a big bastard. He crucified with the drop of a hat, he was crucified with a grandma. Uh, and in fact, Pilate was ultimately dismissed, dishonorably dismissed from the Roman service, and you had to be pretty dishonorable. <laughs> um, anyway. um, yeah. uh, so tragedy, tragedy is not necessarily about um, coming to a sticky end, obviously some tragedy. It's about the fact that you have to be broken to be remade. Nothing can be so whole which is not remade as as he is Christ. Um, it's about the fact that the only hope and there are no guarantees of a new life is that you undergo this process of radical self dispossession. My own work here, my own later work, has been increasingly think, focusing on this, but at three levels one political, the other theological, and the other psychoanalytical, because there are equivalents to this process of self dispossession in all of these things. And, but it's only through compact with failure 
the true power derives, as Simon Beck, who is a poet, only through a combat with things which can be authentic power. And that is something to do with sacrifice. I have just published a well known brilliant book, Radical <laughs> Sacrifice, which is all about this struggle we think of as a sacrifice. Um, that, um, uh, First thing that Christianity does to the human being is, is of course, to drag it. Well, symbolically. That, of course, must be washing all this kind of drag. You have to go under the process of self dispossession if you want to come out and be welcomed by the community on the other side. Um, so there is, a, there, is a, there are connections. When, when, when Marx talks about the proletariat as a class, not a class, a class which um, suffers the loss of humanity in order to gain humanity, he's talking in traditional sacrificial terms. Because one of the most interesting means of sacrifice is you know, not Kantarian to some superior power, but the passage of the inconsiderable thing from the power. That is what sacrifice is about. But of course, only no one had arrived in a good society if the very meaning of power itself had been changed. Not people would change the concept of power, but the very meaning of it has changed. The, um, the martyr is, is he or she who tries to make something out of their own death, the ultimate self dispossession, who tries to make their death a gift to others, um, like one of the greatest martyrs. Alas, it's also one of the longest novels in the world. Um, but to uh, mark is somebody who, 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 who makes a sign, who turns his own death into a sign or signify it. And crucially, the martyr must be somebody who doesn't want to die. Yes, doesn't want to die. In fact, people who want to die are in the suicides, so potential suicides. They give up their lives because their lives have become wretched and worthless. And to me, carry on with it. Um, but the martyr gives up what he or she most values, which is life itself, and therefore becomes a witness to what Mark Marshall calls a great means witness, becomes a witness to something even more precious. Hence the boring and common misunderstanding of celibacy in the church. I just come back from the Carmelite convent, and I was in uh, Yorkshire, to whom I dedicated my book on sacrifice, because they, have all, Understand that um, sacrifice doesn't mean it's not anti life, it's not you know, austere and self denying and masochistic, it is actually giving up voluntarily something which you regard as precious, in this case, sexuality, you know, in the name of something even more precious as far as they are concerned. So, um, death is the ultimate self disposition, and in order to Die to be able to die properly, um, we have to rehearse that sort of situation. And the simple rehearsal of it, the giving of ourselves away, of course, is known as love. Love is linked to death in all kinds of ways, not least Freud, Sabotas, and Eros. But that's one way in which love is a kind of dry run for uh, prelude to that ultimate self manifestment, the dry and warm, which is death. I've just written a book on it. Yeah. Um, I like sheer metal or something. <laughs> um, which I love my publishers. But I said, I might like to bring this up posthumously. <laughs> had a note saying the author rejects the charge, which is recent best in the publicity stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure of that at all. Um, Yes, just to, uh, I, I'm sorry for the so long. Just to conclude, um, uh, Mark, Marx is about revolutionary reversal. That's a very, very today. You have to look at the Hebrew scriptures, uh, standing things on their head, uh, gargling the logic of the world, making them into some other kind of logic, and inviting them to the 
carry is the source of that is an exploring scene in Luke, which is where um, he puts into the mouth of an obscure young Jewish woman, Mary, a pregnant woman, um, he puts into her mouth what the Old Testament scholars believe is probably uh, a zealot child, a zealot being, of course, the uh, anti Well, characters will be not in my mind. He is cast down and raised from their thrones and then raised from their thrones. This is, this is all cliche, a very important cliche. He is still the poor with good things and riches and empty way and so on. This being put in the mouth of a totally obscure provincial gallery is an utter country park in the kind of place. So, uh, when that side of the Cross, um, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, is like a sick joke. And Nazareth, two sophisticated Jerusalem people, would be you know, something like Barnes, <laughs> 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 if you like. I mean, something said that Fred Smith and Barnes would be president of the universe. <laughs> 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 taking the Mickey out of Jesus, mocking him, and so on. Um, just a final word about the idea of love. Um, what Marxism and Christianity have in common again, I think, is that for them, love is nothing personal. Nothing personal. Uh, we, of course, suffer under this rather debased uh, tradition of romantic, sentimental, erotic love, thinking about love, interpersonal, our own interpersonal. Not only for least, I mean for New Testament, of course, but it doesn't. Nothing to do with what does nothing to do with feeling. Wittgenstein once said, uh, love is not a feeling. So that's what he means. So you know, just got out a bit more. <laughs> love is not a feeling. But I think, I think one of the things he meant was um, you could, it, would, it wouldn't make sense to say that couldn't have been pain because it only lasted 10 seconds. That wouldn't make sense. But it would make sense to say that couldn't have been love. Love is a disposition, a narrative, um, not simply as it were an isolated sensation. Um, and the point about well, the paradigm of love for the New Testament, of course, is love of strangers and enemies, not love of friends, human friends. Love is hard work because it's about strangers and enemies. Um, and therefore, it's nothing to do with feeling. It's to do with the fact that you, you, know, you give a cup of water to somebody, it doesn't matter to them. There is something that is going to deeply and personal about uh, that, and not just as the Hebrew Scriptures presents the love of God as ruthless and violent and shattering. The fire of hell is God. God is presented as a flame of fire. Um, now, um, if you have a situation personally, Flourishes of one person is the condition and ground of the flourishing of the other. Yes, if you fancy a very simple form flourishing, that's the name of that love. And what Marx is trying to do is to ask the question what would be the political equivalent? How would that work? You know, love is a social practice, not a sentiment. It's very important. Um, how would that work? Well, of course, the liberals, the, liberals, the great liberal tradition, which Marx had so much respect as well as ferociously criticized them, the great liberal tradition uh, believes in the flourishing of the individual. But, as it were, you know, each does his or her own thing, basically, in another atom of this kind of play. Marx thought that um, the flourishing of the individual had to be reciprocal, it had to be in and through. And that seems to me, it seems to me to be very hard to think of a better, a richer ethics. But it's also kind of odd. Take a simple concrete example. Marx seems to envisage the future economy, the socialist economy, as a sort of um, decentral assembly or self governing cooperatives or something of the kind. But a cooperative is exactly that situation in which your own uh, expression work. It is um, 
which this time in terms of the expression of others, and it isn't actually enhancing. Mark, it's not, that's not original. But it's a very, and of course, it's part of the virtue ethics tradition. It's part of how the tradition sees ethics not, in the first place, as a matter of duty and responsibility and obligation, and those things, of course, have their place, not in a more Kantian terms, but in terms of what Aristotle called well being, eudaimonia, something like the long disease, but even um, happiness, happiness. For Marx, Marx is a Pure virtue ethicist, in the sense that he is concerned with human happiness. But I think that's the question that isn't normally raised by the virtue tradition, namely, what would it take materially, what condition would have to be in place materially for that ethical goal to be, you know, not realized, no, it's perfect, but approximated to it? How, how, how would you go about doing that at the level of our society? Uh, how you how we, would you have what some theories would call political life? Political life. Certainly not the sense of that, from the rather degenerate, you know, romantic, sentimentalist, cozy notion of love. I hope loving love as agape or caritas, marks and heritage in the way, not in the least of it, you know, it's not cozy handle of lives. And on that um, cheerful life. Thank you for the invitation for the wonderful talk. We take questions now. Fascist 
Hadil, to be diverse, is what a matter came from to the other side of the age of the country. Um, so um, I don't think that the so called transgressing boundaries is always a value. I think the certain boundaries are possibly transgressed. But I think that in academia, interventions with him have been crossing boundaries for some time. And I think that's largely been improved. Yeah. 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 I wanted to ask. Um, Point related to, I guess, your final earlier remarks about, about love and kind of the um, virtue ethics kind of drawn from Hegel and, and, and Aristotle. Um, how can we fit, I guess, into Marxist thinking the ideas of, of pleasure or desire in more like psychoanalytical terms? You mentioned Lost in the Wilds. So I wanted to kind of perhaps extend how desire and sexual desire might relate to love in more Marxist terms. Yeah, that's a good, very good it's a gaping absence of Marx's sexuality. I mean, he says some very good things about family. And, 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 again, he shares with the New Testament a very key proposition. Almost every reference to family in the New Testament is resoundingly negative. So, because it ties you to the status quo. Jesus is a footloose, vagrant, without partner, without um, But there is. Um, Real problem with Marxist, well, many problems with his ethics. Um, one of them is the problem of desire. That's to say that it's part that our Marx is in the romantic libertarian tradition, which assumes that um, what's important is that one should realize or fulfill what he calls one's powers and capacity. Mantra, really. But first of all, um, how do you discriminate between those powers and capacities which are creative? There seem to be some criteria independent of that in order to determine whether, you know, whether, whether a particular action represents an authentic self expression and what Freud's teaching about desire tells us is that there, there is no form, there is no uh, absolute fulfillment, and there can't be, because there's that at the very center of our trying to which wishes to undo it and which is opposed to it, which is kind of antagonist. Yes. Um, not least um, investing in our own happiness, which we do all the time, in order to protect a savage superego. Um, so, you know, Marx, Marx writes before Freud. I mean, Marx is it's a good old fashioned romantic humanist for some stuff, it has all the difficulties as well as the virtue of that basis. But then, Later on, came along the school of Marx, not least the Frankfurt School, which precisely tried to put Freud and Marx together in those ways to rethink Marx in psychoanalytic terms. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, what would Marx think about the artificial intelligence era? You know? Like that robots are uh, the new uh, working class. What would Marx think about sorry, the, the, uh, the artificial intelligence? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. I hope nobody is going to ask that. Normally, I plan to be the audience to ask. I don't know anything about that. As far as the new working class goes, well, of course, of course, it was again, that's an important distinction. What has dwindled on the global scale is the traditional proletariat of the 19th century. Proletariat, productive industrial workers, and so on. Um, but that's not the same thing as the working class disappearing, not least if you take account of the enormous service industry, among other things. The service industry, which is certainly part of the working class in Marx's definition of the term. Um, it's, it, 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 it's an enormous sector of the global economy, and um, so I think it's partly a matter of definition. You know, what what has changed? What isn't for Marx? What remains constant are the relations of exploitation, or social, what call social, or social relations. That's what remains constant. You can pump profit out of people in all 
pineapples. I don't know what they are in that sense. He's not concerned with different kinds of labor laws. He's not concerned with sociology, let's say, categorizing workers in that form. Um, he's concerned <coughs> with um, the dynamics of social relations and how, how, that, how that helps to reproduce the system. Yes, thank you for coming. I wanted to have you in Cambridge. I wanted to ask you about the ultimate ends of Marxism. So you define how, um, uh, after the social revolution, there was this uh, uh, limitless leisure, kingdom of leisure, and a kind of aristocratic pneumonia. Um, but it seems like with, with the limitless leisure, that you don't have any limits. You don't also have any defining end for your leisure. And if you don't have any defining end, then for Aristotle, you wouldn't also have a form. You wouldn't be able to actualize the form of the human. And human life would be ultimately disoriented. Purposeless. So I want to ask you, um, in this condition, how would you say it's possible not only to organize and motivate a workers' movement, but also to give us hope for the future? Do we we think the limits of that work? I mean, if you have a limitless leisure, I mean, if everyone is just given limitless leisure of well, new obligations. Yes. I think I don't think Marx actually believes that, although again we're very on very scanty evidence. Um, Marx is really um, as a materialist. Mark is really alert to the limitation. He's not, um, he's not given to hubris. You know, he's not given to the, to the infinite extendability of humanity. He knows that all of this is encircled by limited natural resources, by limited capacities, and so on. In fact, of course, what he's opposed to is exactly what we might call you know, Trumpian ideology. Or not only Trump, but I'm afraid, with all due respect to the Americans. America, which is indeed the most extraordinary of this thing, this nonsense you hear everywhere in the States about, I can be anything I want. Yes? Where, where the self is just playing your hands and you can stamp your will. Because the other side of that is a ferocious Puritan voluntarism, uh, which you stamp your will and stamp your will. And there's no end uh, to human self development. I mean, when the Greeks heard uh, this, they just shuddered and looked to the skies, waiting for the thunder. Um, the, 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 um, no, Marx, I think, quite in Spanish, no ethics of politics, which for Aristotle, just a side of the same coin, could, can be built except upon a recognition of finitude. And part of that finitude is a recognition of death. And Marx talks about, he doesn't say very much about death, but he says that. Death is part of the way the species as such bears in upon the individual. Yes. He's very concerned with his early world, something of course, um, government disease, and so that species being. What is it about the material nature of humanity uh, which um, both enables us and, and, and limits us? Yes. How do we make Marx more Because I recently took a photo with the statue of Marx in Congress as well. And I've got a lot of concerned messages from people like you. <laughs> <laughs> so we were from all over the world, really. So I'm from Asia, but um, like this Eastern European person thought, how can you support that evil man? And that a lot of person told me, you know, are you like a powerful communist who wants to take all my money? So how do I give up? Like, how do I use like non how do we use non academic language to approach an average person and say, you know, how do we talk about Marx really? Because right now there's a lot of academic literature and I'm hearing a lot of academic talk, but nothing really for the common person. So I find that a challenge as well with the conversation. The message is certainly one of the easiest I've ever sent an email in my life. Which I have a very strange that I have a common two people in know. <laughs> Three of us are following out things. Um, well, um, I, I think it's the full of this I rather call that the Communist Manifesto. Because don't forget, we need a piece of the which is not written in particularly difficult. It's not Kitty's Quartz either, for sure. You know, it's, it's, um, the, that, Things of the low, lowish level of literacy, and they learn very quickly if there's something in it. 
greater than we have achieved the shame of creating something new. Yeah. There has to be something in it for people to rise up against the power. Um, as long as that power oppresses them, it's still go on throwing them a few goodies in the air. The perils of the obscurity of an alternative to it are rationally dissuade people from going to the world. Okay, so that's quite rational. The moment, however, that those powers can't say it, is the moment, say, in the apartheid state, before the apartheid, the moment before the Stalinism, the Eastern Europe, people will become just sure to make fun of the egg. Well, why not? Why not? Because there's nothing, you know, no reason why they um, So I don't think it's, not, it's simply as it were a matter of style. It's not even a matter of you know, what language is available and accessible. But that's culturally relative. People will learn. Easily, if not easily enough, that they will be ready for them if they feel that there's something new. I, years ago, gave a talk to that. There was an organization group called, very interesting, called the Work of Writers Association, which consisted of groups of working people in different cities who, were, who came together to talk about their writing and to read, and then mostly it was an article stuff to each other. And I was asked to talk to them about the theory of the world of and tried to keep it. You know, uh, so non elaborate and so on. And then, no sooner I finished, uh, an elderly woman in fact, I think, like, said to me in her rich West Country accent, What kind of language is that? You want to talk about It's not going to be easy and accessible enough. Before I can say what she said, because I'd like to learn that language. Yeah? So beware of those. Aware of being patronizing as well, you know, to say, oh, people can possibly do that. They, they will learn it if they have to. You know, okay. I have two questions to that sort of um, The first one is there's a criticism of Marx um, in terms of all the Jewish question of the international sequence. And actually, it's a counter argument saying that you look at the original Jewish, he's using the same language that Bauer is using in order to live for him. So I wondered if you had one. Argument. And secondly, um, whether you have an opinion on the argument of separationists that say, you know, if, if you're on the left and you want to see communism happen, then actually you should be going out and voting for the biggest neocon Trumpian, you know, that you can find. Because if you genuinely believe that capitalism is, you know, thinking it's so great, then that would be the the So just want to do yes. that. From Charles Fisher, of course, the current president of the government. Charles has any most diverse arguments against Hamburg. Typical of somebody who comes from a small nation, I don't know the margin of this one. It's actually a Menshevik case, isn't it? In terms of the Russian Revolution, the Menshevik argument that, um, that you have to have, in a sense, you have to have capitalism in order to be able to push it to a certain simplicity. Marx sometimes said that actually. He actually said that about his native German. He would have to learn capitalism. Um, it's a very teleological line. Um, there are necessary stages and so on. Um, I, 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 think it's, I think it's quite dangerous. It's, 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 a, it's a version of left catastrophism. Just that you only can change things if there is a general disaster. Collapse. The point about that is that people who want to pull their backs are not likely to make good revolutionary agents. Nor, of course, this is the paradox, are people who feel fine, who are buoyant and confident. And, you know, that's a very complicated system. Um, what's the problem? Jewish question. Yeah. I think it's ages since I've read that. It's not that much of a phrase for it. I think there's quite a lot to say for the fact that, that Marx is there uh, quite often. Jewishness as metaphorical, yes. But I think it's also true that Marx and Jew did at times make out of Marx. No doubt about that, it was actual life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I uh, really do a lot of the way that you use to more prioritized language of exploitation or the language of power in a lot of ways. You know, um, the circumcision. 
Mexico, power is really big in social theory. And I was wondering if you could talk about you know, the value of focusing more on exploitation rather than power as a category. That's, that's the difference between, it's one difference between the Marxist and the Kindness. Of course, the Kindness is the Kindness. Marxism is certainly something about power, but it doesn't see power as um, power itself is ultimately the market in the service of material interests. And the problem is the following areas. I mean, in a way, the market is ultimately the market. This is also very different from that. But on the root, the problem with the market is that it sort of over politicizes. Um, it sometimes, as I said before, forgets that power is enabling and creating. Of course, famous is what the power is made but it doesn't need more of that. Um, uh, the power is an interesting thing. Um, but we don't really fully know that once the meaning, the present meaning of power, is been radically transformed. Um, uh, in a sense, I think, for, for, um, you know, it's not as though for Marxism, what's crucial is crucial as something called the economy, which itself is. It's rather that the, the, the politics of to some degree is important in the interests. And Foucault, a student of Louis Althusser, who was celebrated in Marcus Russell's in the 20th century, is very much, a lot of, I think, a lot of Foucault's work, not just in this way, can be read as a, as a reaction, but at times only a reaction. Given the many misunderstandings of Marxist thought that you've identified in your fascinating talk, would you still would you say that Marx was a Marxist? <laughs> <laughs> he, of course, denied it. He didn't think that he was a super Marxist. I can't remember the context, but certainly Marx said he wasn't a communist. Um, uh, meaning, I suppose, that he didn't accept many of the interpretations of Marx. That slightly sort of Marxists adopted. Um, I'm not sure if this is quite a good point. <coughs> I think that there's just, for me, there's just, you could ask, um, you could ask what is it to be a Marxist? It's not too obvious, of course. How many of the 39 articles do we have to sign on for? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and there's hardly, there's hardly. Marxist doctrine that some Marxist or other hasn't rejected. You know, the labor theory of value, certain value, um, I don't know, all kinds of doctrines. The problem is that um, if you want to let's ask the question what is peculiar to Marxism? What is peculiar to Marxist theory in the sense of what does it have that other theories don't? I think, there, I think there is an answer to that question, which uh, I will give you privately if you approach me later. Uh, it's very, very small thing. <laughs> 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 See, I think, I think what's, what's peculiar to Marxism is something that's really very technical. It's the doctrine of the contradiction between forces and relations of production and the relations that are strong. That's all very technical stuff, and many of Marxists has disagreed really can't remember what that means. Um, but I don't know of any other social theory or political theory that actually has that particular topic. That for Marx is the motor of history. It's the transformation of one mode of production into another by virtue of the clash or conflict between the forces of religion and production that for Marx. <coughs> Nobody else I know believes that. The problem is that is a very problematic concept. Yes. Um, lots of other so called Marxist doctrines are not original to Marx at all. I mean, communism, very ancient revolution. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that the state is the ultimate custodian of property, 
this one. Um, you can hardly find a thing about the one that is original to him in the other than this rather um, you know, controversial. So, what did this, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of Marxists would disagree, but I, I was in the wrong situation to think well, what is this peculiar to Marxism? What makes it stand out is also what makes this problematic. Oh, well, I, I would say, just to like thought. I don't, you know, I don't really speak to the world some of Marxists. I have to know to speak to people about Marxists. Okay, I'm not drunk. I don't think, uh, well, I don't think, that, I, don't, I don't think the real difference, even, in this case, is simply to the left and right, how we characterize things. I think what really matters is the difference between people Genuinely and sincerely think that things, well, there are real problems in the world, but basically things are okay and probably can get them. And those who don't believe that, those who don't believe that, think that's not okay. I think the, it's, it's a dividing line between those who think that things are basically okay, you can't some of this go, every river, and those who think things are very bad indeed. If you take a global problem, <laughs> um, I mean, it's just that the wholesale redefinition of Marxism, I mean, it's abandonment in Russia, the wholesale redefinition in China of what is meant by Marxism. Hasn't it meant that the philosophy 200 years on has become almost anything, a bit like Christianity, almost anything you want it to be? Well, I think that's perhaps for me too far. I don't like to say it too far. It's been a uh, but I think it, I think it is. Um, it is true that um, that in China they have um, a very uh, interesting form of communism known as capitalism. The ultimate, um, uh, as it were, Orwellian redefinition. Um, um, uh, and, and of course, all of these things are are speculative. You know, and there's nothing wrong with the socialism being covered with a multitude of different policies, different ideas. And so we must be aware of the pathetic unity, you know, unity of all costs. Um, uh, so I wouldn't quite agree that they can just be anything at all. Um, but there has to be an understanding of the history of Marxism and the very vicissitudes from which it's gone. And the material condition. And that's part of the task, not just to sweep it under the carpet. We're almost out of time. We'll just take one last question. Uh, just, uh, okay, there are two questions. We'll, okay. just we'll collect both of them together. Right. Thank you. 
itself is supposed to kind of carry the parts, um, which is not to underestimate you know, for the moment achievements or values, but just to, uh, just as with Nietzsche, who was a great thinker of the past, calling costs to how much power and love and suffering lie at the root of all the quotes and noble things. It isn't necessary to say they're not um, but that um, so the mistake of the liberal progressive was to think that the civilization, the barbarism and civilization are sequential. First we have barbarism, then we have civilization. Not at all. They are simple, they're They're side of the same coin. Um, and um, the authority, the very authority which rules civilization, um, if you see that in Freudian terms as part of the sort of weaker, well, of course, it's a really absolutely important function to play, but it is also the superior is out of control. I mean, it's violent and brutal. It, it demands things on us that we, we want to know we can't do. And it's unreasonable, unreasonable. And there are forms of authority like that. And, they, and what they do is simply drive the islands to spare or into rebellion. And then you have a kind of small connective between this reasonable on the one hand and and the uh, rebellious id you know, on the other hand. Sorry it's come a long way from what you were saying, but I was trying to distract people so they realize that you sat you asked well I think there's another question from the audience on the video. Um is there a book for directly in this view of ethics? Mutually flourishing ethics, then you just describe the matter. I, I, always, I always try to avoid the word ethics, actually. I mean, um, it's not to say it's not important. I, I, I hardly ever use that in my work. Partly because um, it's, it's often used by Marxists in rather a very fine place, the dialectic, because there is some kind of history or recurrent mechanism. 